Good morning. Welcome to the Indonesian Evangelical Church English Service. We are glad that you are able to join us again uh, as we, tr we worship him online. Let's prepare our heart as we are going into the worship. Call to worship this morning is taken fr uh, from Psalm 95, verse 6. And the, the word of the Lord said, O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the, the Lord, our maker. Let's pray. Dearly Father, thank you that the privilege that you have given us this morning, Lord, that we could gather together from wherever we are virtually to worship you. Even on this unusual circumstances, Lord, you give us the opportunity to worship you online. We are thankful for all the uh, online ministry personnel, the praise team, and Pastor Steve, who has been uh, putting their effort and their labor of love week after week so that we will be able to continue to worship you uh, every Sunday on the Lord's Day. And as we come to you this morning, Lord, uh, perhaps there is any of us who come with a heavy burden, Lord. If you will, uh, we pray that you will lessen or you lift up uh, this burden. Per oh. We also would like to pray for perhaps there any of us who are affected by this COVID-19 pandemic, whether financially, uh, spiritually, or emotionally, Lord. We pray that you will help each of us to grow to this challenge and give us the peace, give us the strength to go through all these uh, challenges th th that we are facing. We also would like to pray for uh, the preparation to the in-person worship that we are planning. Uh, we pray that uh, you will prepare each of us, Lord, and give us the wisdom and help each of us to be able to adjust uh, how to attend this in-person service. We also would like to pray for our country, Lord, that uh, with the upcoming uh, racial injustice issue, we pray for uh, the demonstration, and uh, we pray for the leaders that they will be able to uh, control this demonstration, especially those who are taking advantage and uh, the anarchists which uh, create rioting and looting. We pray for those who are a victim of all those, Lord, that you will help them and you will bring peace again and uh, orderly manner in this country. We just pray for this morning service, Lord, that uh, you will use uh, Pastor Steve and anoint him so everything coming out from his mouth will be a blessing to each of us and uh, help us to be able to uh, joyfully praise you as the praise team is going to help us and give us a listening ear and a receptive heart so that we can enjoy the service. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Let's start with the uh, Apostles' Creed, and we are going to uh, recite the Apostles' Creed together. The Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, who crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and seated on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to just the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen.
chaos back into order who makes the orphans a son and daughter For the 
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you today just to give thanks, Father. Thank you for everything that you've done for us. Thank you that during this pandemic that you still give us health, that you can still have our family. Thank you, Father, for everything you've done for us. Thank you for your guidance. Thank you for your protection. Father, I also thank you today that we can come to worship you and we come to come to, to your place that we can worship you and we can um, uh, listen to your word and uh, singing our praises to you and, and also um, pray to you also, Father. Thank you, Father, for everything again. I like to pray. We like to pray for our service today. Please help us, Lord. We can prepare our hearts and our mind and we can listen to your words. And not only listen to your words, we can also do it our daily lives. I'd like to also pray for Pastor Steve that's going to be delivering the message for, for us. Please bless him and that we can listen to, to, to uh, your words and be a blessing for us. Father, also we'd like to um, pray, uh, continue to pray for our, our church, uh, continue to bless our church, and continue to blessing our church. Thank you that you continue, that we, um, week after week during this pandemic, that we can continue to worship you, even though during um, streamline online, but we can still continue to worship you. And Father, thank you again that, that there's an opportunity that we can come back to church again in the near future. Please help us, Father, that we can prepare our hearts also and prepare uh, the church that we can do the right thing and, 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 and we can worship to you accordingly. Father, also we like to pray for um, our brothers and sisters um, that is affected by this pandemic, either, either the health or the financials. Uh, like to pray, we like to pray that you can help them, give them strength, give them peace and comfort from you. And we know, Father, that that you will continue to bless them and we continue to help them to find um, um, everything that we need to do uh, in order for them to continue um, um, you know, glorifying your name. Father, I'd like to also pray for everybody else that is um, looking for um, um, a job. Please help them also, Father, give them wisdom and, and faith and um, also waiting for you that you can bless them Continue to bless them and also uh, provide for them. Thank you, Father, again for everything that you've done for us. I also like to pray for um, for those that is affected by the pandemic in terms of uh, they lost their their loved one. Father, we know that it's hard for us to um, lose someone that we love, but I like to uh, we like to pray for you that give you also give this family strength and comfort from you, and you continue to bless them and, and, and um, give them strength, Father. I'd like also pray for, uh, we'd like to pray for um, our family, especially for those that haven't um, accept you as their savior. Father, we like, we're, we're really longing for them to accept you as their savior. Please um, help them, they can see your love for them. They can they open their heart for you and they can receive you as a savior. Again, again, Father, I'd like to also continue to um, surrender our lives into your hands and please continue to use us, use our lives to be a blessing for other people and not also that, we also like to use our lives to be glorifying your name also, Father. Please help us and give us strength again, Father. Again, Father, we like to surrender our service um, from the beginning to the end into your hands. Please use this service to glorify your name and it can also give us strength. Thank you, Father. In your name we pray. Amen. Hey, good morning, everyone. Hey, welcome to this worship this morning. I know that the uh, setting has changed. The look is a little bit different, but we're just getting ready for our normal worship, and we know that eventually it will happen, but we're just trying to get ready for it. So with that said, hey, let's turn to our passage for this morning. It comes to us from Psalm chapter 143, verses 1 through 6. Psalm Chapter 143, verses 1 through 6. And the word of the Lord says, O Lord, hear my prayer. Listen to my cry for mercy. In your faithfulness and righteousness, come to my relief. 
Do not bring your servant into judgment, for no one living is righteous before you. The enemy pursues me. He crushes me to the ground. He makes me dwell in darkness like those long dead. So my spirit grows faint within me. My heart within me is dismayed. I remember the days of long ago. I meditate on all your works and consider what your hands have done. I spread out my hands to you. My soul thirsts for you like a parched land. Amen. If you could join with me in a word of prayer, and we'll get started. Lord God, as we are gathered here, we know, Lord God, that there is no time and space for you. You know, Lord God, the present as well as the future. So, Lord God, we want to give you the glory. We want to give you complete obedience. We want to follow you. So, Lord, may we surrender into your hands. And we really trust, Lord, that the things that we are going through, seen and unseen, you'll be the focus. You'll be the one. And, Lord, I hope as we are worshiping wherever we may be, we will surrender this time to you, that we will give you our very best. We will remove all the distractions. And in Jesus' name, we will say, you are my Lord, you are my Savior, and you deserve our very best worship. So, Lord, thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When people make promises, when people make promises to you that seem maybe generally too generous, or maybe really generous, how do you react to those promises? Do you think it's far-fetched? Do those promises seem like an impossible promise to keep? Do you say, that will never happen? Those promises you just stated to me, I, I, I have no hope for it. Or are you one of those people who says, you know what, I believe that, that promise that you just gave me, it will come true. For instance, my son and I both love cars. Not the Pixar movie, but real cars. We, he thinks cars are cool, just like me. So one day as we are going somewhere, as we're driving, then my five-year-old Micah said to me, Hey, Dad, do you like that Ferrari sports car? And I said, yeah, I love Ferraris. I, I love Ferrari sports cars. Then he said, okay, Dad, I will buy you a Ferrari and a Rolls Royce. I said, all right, son, that's awesome. Obviously, I'm going to remind you that Micah is only five years old when he said that. But I am going to remind him for the rest of his life he made that promise to me. I'm going to say, Micah, you promised me when you're five years old, a Ferrari and a Rolls Royce. So how would you react to a statement just like that? Dad, I'm going to make you a promise. Is that a promise that you hope and believe will happen? Or is it one of those promises where you go, that's too far-fetched? Especially when you think it's too impossible to keep be it a five-year-old, someone that is poor, someone that is distant? What is your reaction to promises? There are times when people read God's word, and they read about some of God's promises and think it's too far-fetched. It's a promise that seems too difficult to keep. For instance, I want to read to you Psalm 34, 18. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. If you just read that, he says he delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. God is making a promise to those who are crushed in spirit. God promises to save them. 
That's a great promise to hear. It is a great promise to hear, especially if you are broken and hurting. But in the back of your mind, is that possible? There are times in our life when it feels like our spirit has been crushed and we are broken and we want to hear something. But the question is, how much of you will say, yeah, I believe it? For those who are going through some difficult times right now, how many of the words that God has given, the promises that God has given, do you embrace? You just got laid off. How about someone close to you? Someone you love is sick. And you read these words like Psalm 34, 18, when it says, he delivers them from all their troubles. There are times when people are going some difficult times. How do you deal with the promises of God? This morning, I want to let you know that the promises of God, of saving those whose spirit is crushed, is a promise that he keeps. Let me repeat that. God keeps his promises. I want to share with you one of the ways that God restores us and why he does so. Because there's many ways that God keeps his promises, especially for those who are broken, who are crushed, who are going through struggles. This morning will be one of those times. When we look at these first four verses of Psalm 143, we can read that David, who is the, the writer of this, is going through some difficult times. The words make it very clear. The very first line says of desperation and difficulty. It says, O Lord, hear my prayer. Listen to my cry for mercy. This is not a bedtime prayer for David. He's not saying, oh, I'm about to go to sleep. I should say my prayers. This verse shows an emotional edge. He is pleading David is not only offering a prayer, but David is begging for intervention from God. He is in a desperate situation, and he pleads before God, God, I need you. When David says, listen to my cry for mercy, he is pouring his heart out. This is the moment when David is being completely open to God. Nothing is being held back. Obviously, it's an understatement when he says, I am pleading before you. I am crying out. When we are truly in a desperate situation, what do we have to lose? And this is a moment of what we call intimacy with God. Last Sunday, I mentioned about the idea of intimacy. Here is an example of intimacy with God. There is no hiding of feelings or thoughts. He is just pouring out his thoughts and emotions. In a sense, he is standing before naked and he is stripped bare and there is no clothes on. And he's just saying, God, here I am. There he is saying, God, here I am. Nothing is being hidden from you. My heart, my mind, my soul is being poured out to you. This is a moment of real intimacy with God. And we all need to be doing this. We all need to be in front of God saying, there's nothing to be hidden. And in this moment, David asked, do not bring your servant into judgment, which reflects the terrible situation David is in. He is asking that his life would be spared from the spears and the swords and the arrows that are chasing after him. The idea when it says judgment is when someone dies and goes before God in the judgment chair, judgment seat, looking at God, wondering, should I go to be with the Lord or do I go down? 
Everyone will be judged, heaven or hell. But that's after death. So David is pleading, I don't want to face judgment because I'm not ready to die. I want to live. So he is fearing for his life. He thinks he's about to die. David's situation is that he is being pursued by King Saul, the king of Israel. As it says in verse 3, The enemy pursues me. He crushes me to the ground. He makes me dwell in the darkness like those long dead. David is on the run. He's gone from one city to village to town to one mountain to another hill. He is going from place to place. He is being pursued by the most powerful man of Israel. His army is chasing after David because King Saul is jealous. He is jealous of David, which means that soldiers and government officials are looking for David so that he can be captured and eventually killed. And as it says, He is literally in a dark place. Not only metaphorically, in the sense that he is scared, he is alone, he is troubled, he is crushed. But David is also hiding in caves. He is hiding in caves in the mountains, alone. And if you really want to follow all of it, read 1 Samuel chapter 18 to 28 about the history and the details about these events. On several occasions, King Saul threw a spear at David. By God's grace, David was able to elude it and escape. And as we read, this is a time that King Saul and his army is chasing after David. And as a result, there he is hiding in deserts, in hills and mountains, in the dark caves, as we read in verse 3. And what he says, it says, he is crushed to the ground. He makes me dwell in darkness like those long dead. The emphasis is the idea that where do they bury the dead? They put them in caves. That is their tomb. Just like Jesus was put into a cave. So he is really speaking to the fact that not only is he hiding but he feels like he is dying. Emotionally, physically, spiritually, he feels like he is dying. So that really is the emphasis of how far he has gone. So you could understand how desperate he is. You could understand the emotional overtone of this. So when it gets hard, David says, I got to plead before the Lord. And that's what he does. He is broken in spirit and he feels crushed. Wouldn't you feel that way? When the most powerful man in the country is chasing after you? Trying to kill you? So David's confused. He's saying, why is King Saul trying to kill me? There he is sitting in caves wondering, what did I do wrong? What Wrong did I do to warrant this terrible existence? David did nothing wrong to be chased down like an animal. And even David admits in verse 2, for no one living is righteous before you. He's saying, yeah, I'm not perfect. But with that said, David is seeking comfort from God. And David is crying out, please, please, Lord, help me. I am broken. And this is really the idea of surrendering. When we talk about surrendering, just think about any old-time war movie, be it Civil War, the enemy's in front of you, and they say, surrender. You basically come out with your hands up, and you are at the mercy of your captors. In a spiritual sense, when we surrender to God, We have submitted our will completely and said, God, I surrender. I am am complete submission to you. So he says, 
my hope, my dreams, I submit to you. It's gone. So what does God do to restore the broken spirit of David? God leads David to remember. I know, you're like, what? With all that being chased, almost dying, God causes David to remember. Some of you out there watching, listening, thinking, is that some kind of relief, God? God has this ability, using the Holy Spirit, to allow us to remember things that maybe we've long forgotten. And God leads David to remember. Because when David goes to God in his broken spirit, David is looking for hope. David is looking for hope. In his current situation, all he sees is a disaster. He sees death. He asks himself, Why should I continue? So David, maybe he himself doesn't quite understand what he needs, but that's how awesome our God is. When we go and surrender, God says, okay, let me start restoring you. And one of the ways he restores is saying, I want you to remember. Given the predicament that David's in, David is hoping that God will make him or take him to a better place. But God leads David to remember why. Why is remembering an answer? Because God is giving David assurance of what is true. Assurance is a reminder of what God has done and what has been demonstrated already to you and with you. Let me repeat that. Assurance is a reminder of what God has done and what has been demonstrated already to you and with you. See, God causes David to remember what God has done. In a sense, God is throwing him a rope. And he's saying, see, I have shown you hope before. I'm going to show you hope again. Not only what David has witnessed, but also to remember how God has worked through him. David starts remembering, hey, God has led the army of Israel to defeat armies that were bigger and more powerful. God has restored those memories and saying, remember those times when the Philistines And all these other armies that were bigger and more powerful, it should just killed us. But yet we were able to have victory. David witnessed these victories firsthand. God also causes David to remember how God worked through him. Experiencing the power of God to victory. David remembers that God led him to kill the Goliath of the Philistines. Any one of those moments could have caused death for David. But God led him to victory and to life. So as David is sitting in this cave, as David is pleading, he's remembering, wow, God has proven himself. God has shown himself God has revealed himself in a powerful way before. I have a reason to hope. God causes David to remember so that he would know that God has been there and that God has been with you from the very beginning through the tough times and the good times. To remember what God has done is to know that there is hope. To remember is to remind ourselves that God has walked beside us on a journey through life together. Remembering is a means to assure David that God will lead them, just like he did before. Think about this. 
Moses was told to go into Egypt and free the Hebrew people. Moses is told by God, the burning bush, I want you to go to Pharaoh, the most powerful man in Egypt, and demand that he should release all the Hebrew people from the bondage of slavery. He does. Moses goes nine straight times and failed. Nine straight times. The very first time he went, Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, ordered the Hebrews to make bricks without straws. In other words, Pharaoh punished the Hebrew people for Moses' attempt to free them. What is the reaction of the Hebrew people? They were angry with Moses. You're making us suffer. You're causing greater hardship. We're going to die. Moses wanted to quit. He says, I can't do this. I failed. Moses wanted to go home. I want to quit. Let someone else do the freedom work. Let someone else do the liberation. I'm done. In Moses' inability to get the results he wanted, God assured Moses, it's okay. You see, repeatedly, over and over again, go. Go. I will lead you to do more miracles. Go. These things will be done. Rise early in the morning, and this will happen. God assured Moses that the miracles that were done and the miracles that will occur will lead to freedom for the Hebrew people. In our desperate times, you want to know he is in charge. In desperate and difficult times, you want to know he's in control and he has a plan for you. And many of us may be going through it right now. Or better yet, maybe we know of people that are going through difficult times. And as we sit there and watch our friends, maybe our family, struggling, what can we do? What can we do? I suggest reminding them of the things that God has done in your life, maybe in their life as well. Give them something to hold on to because God will lead you, but we got to surrender. we got to surrender. 2 Timothy 4.16 At my first defense, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. May it be not be held against them, but the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength. Isn't that awesome? Everyone deserted them. And as Paul writes this to Timothy, but God came to my side and gave me strength. What is David's response when he remembers the love of God to him? What is David's response when he remembers all the things that God did through him and with him? God longs and desires God even more. He says, my soul thirsts for you like a parched land. And that, I think that's so true. When people are in trouble and things are hard, it seems that those, who are, those are the times that we're really looking for God. God answers. And we are reminded how good it tastes to be in fellowship with God. The greatest times of struggles and desperations are those times that God is really amazing. There are times when you went through struggles. And maybe even right now as you're watching and listening, is the Holy Spirit talking to you about your desperate times last year, five years ago? When my mom was killed by a drunk driver, I stood naked 
before the Lord. I prayed and I cried out to the Lord. And I asked why. How come? He didn't tell me why. But I knew God stood with me. I felt his comfort. I felt his assurance that it's going to be okay. And it tasted sweet. You know, I'm, I'm not into hugs. You know, I'm not into like, hi, how are you? But there I, 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 I felt naked before God and said, God, why? What happened? And in my own mind, I could really sense God counseling me. And at the very least, God said, first let me comfort you. It's a remembrance of who God is to me. And there is a benefit to soaking yourself in the experiences that you had with God. And God wants you to share those memories so that you can carry on. God does not want you to live a defeated life. God wants you to carry on. And I, and, I, and I ask a lot of you guys, how many of you are struggling right now? Unemployment is at record levels. I was, I was reading the Wall Street Journal. Last time we had a recession was 2008. They said the unemployment numbers are way beyond that. We're, we're at the Great Depression days of 1929. Numbers are staggering. Maybe some of you are those who were laid off. I don't know what's going to happen. But I know who can help, who can guide you. Some of you are wondering about your health. You hear about a second wave of coronavirus that's going to come in winter. And you're, you're wondering, What's next? And if you're a small business owner, you're saying, no, no, not another three, four months of business closure. Do you feel crushed? Uh, many years ago, I um, happened to know this young man, not so young at the time, but we were talking, and it, it was in the midst of the Great Recession of 2008. And he said to me, hey, pastor, uh, I just got laid off. And I felt really bad for him because I understand what it is, how soul-crushing it is for a man to lose a job. He had a, a, a brand-new infant. And think about that. You and your wife are blessed with a brand-new child. But comes along this, you're laid off. And, and, and when he was telling me this, in my mind, I'm thinking, what can I do? What can I give? What can I provide? And the most amazing thing happened. He looked at me and smiled. I said, what can I do? He says, just pray for me. But I know God's there for me. And he said something really incredible. I know God cares. And it's going to be okay. And he said it not with kind of like a smirk. But you knew it was genuine. He smiled at me. And he says, it's going to be okay, Pastor. It's going to be okay. And I knew at that moment... He was a man that was walking with the Lord. I knew right then and there that his, his love for the Lord, his walk with the Lord was real and genuine. Because when he smiled at me, that was a smile of the Holy Spirit saying, God is leading me. That was a smile of surrender to God. He's leading to that place. So I want to give you 
my friends, my brothers and sisters of Christ watching and listening. It's almost over. God's leading you out of these dark times. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. God's going to take you there. So join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for all that you do. Lord God, truly, some of us are going through some difficult times. Some of us know of people who are going through some soul-crushing moments. And Lord God, there are many ways you will comfort us. But one of the ways you will definitely reveal yourself is allowing us to remember what you have done. Allowing us to see what you have done. Allowing us to remember how we have partake in the power of the Holy Spirit. So Lord, may we hold fast and surrender. Because Lord God, it is almost over. You are going to lead us, Lord God. I don't know if it's going to be a week or a month, but Lord God, I will keep hold of your promise. So Lord, thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Oceans arise and thunders roar. I will soar with you above the storm. Father, you are king over the flood. I will be still, know you are God. Oh, I will be still. Team. And uh, now is the time for offering. Offering could be uh, given through cell, or you could also mail the check to uh, our church address, and we will pick it up. Uh, there are a few announcements here. Uh, the first one is the Sunday school, preschool to third grade will be started today at 2.30 p.m. And then the second one, which is the Sunday school class from grade four to eight, it will be started at 3.45 p.m., which is all online. Also, uh, next week, we are going to have a, a Father's Day combined service. So uh, there will be a combined service for Father, 
Father's Day service. And uh, at, the at this time, I would like to ask uh, Pastor Steve to give the uh, guideline for the uh, upcoming in-person worship. We are getting nearer. I can't give you the specific date because it is still uh, going through the process. But I want to assure you that it is getting closer. It could be a week or two or three. We're not really sure. Um, but when we do know, we want to be prepared for you guys. We want to be prepared to say, this is how the church is going to take care of our people. And that's our, our really big concern. We want to make sure that we can worship safely within the, the strict guidelines that the state has given to us. So on the screen, you, you'll, you'll see some things. So please follow me and bear with me. English service will be 11.30 a.m. in the main sanctuary. Indonesian worship will be at 9.30, again, in the main sanctuary. Everyone is welcome to come. However, we are asking that if you are not feeling well, please stay at home. If someone that is close to you, one of your family, your kids, your wife, and they're showing symptoms of COVID-19, we really encourage the whole family to stay at home. There will be online service. That will continue. We'll be streaming at 11.30. So if you are healthy, but you don't feel comfortable participating in in-person worship, that's available for you. Again, number three, if you feel sick or show, show signs of illness, uh, we ask that you take care of your illness and join us when you are well. Um, please bring and wear your face covering. Obviously, it has to cover your mouth and nose. Number five, there will be a temperature screening as you enter the church. We'll have ushers with the uh, scanners, and they will scan your temperature. If it's 100 degrees or higher, we ask that you would take care of your high temperatures at home and consider seeking some medical professionals. Um, it is for safeguard of the entire church, and we are trying to follow the, the strict guidelines that the state has mandated us to cover. Please refrain from any kind of contact inside the church. Handshakes. And I understand that some of us may have not seen each other for a long time. But within the sanctuary, we just ask that uh, you kind of hold off. Next, there will be limited seating inside the sanctuary because of social distancing. There will be an overflow area. The courtyard, which is the open air area, and we also have an area in the chapel. There will be social distancing. There will be TV monitors to watch so that you can participate in the worship. We just ask that you would follow the um, kind of the leading of the ushers. Uh, they will kind of guide you to where to sit, who or where you may be sitting with. Depends on if you're by yourself or with your family. Inside the sanctuary, there will be open seating. However, there should be social distancing of six feet from the nearest non-family individual. Households may sit together or those who participated in the stay-at-home order. Singing can be done with your face mask on. Some people love to sing. Some people not so much. <clears throat> Regardless, please keep your face mask on. Those who do vocal presentations, they will have their mask off. So presider, myself or the speaker, and the praise leader who are singing, they will be uncovered. We'll continue to have offering through Zell. There will be an offering box at the back of the church. There will be no plates or baskets that will be passed around. We are going to do this until the state gives new guidelines. So please bear with us. And all, all we ask is understand what we're trying to do. Because we all want to have worship. 
But as we know, we're in some weird and unprecedented times. So if we all could work together, uh, I think we could have a real awesome worship. And once you get here, yes, it will feel strange. But once you're here, let's just give our Lord our very best. Because in the end, that's why we're here, to worship. All right, folks? So please bear with us. Um, Once the date comes, we'll let you know as soon as possible. All right? So with that said, uh, let's go into a time of doxology. Um, Follow your screens, and we will have doxology. So if you want to stand, we can stand as well, just to make it feel like we're back at worship. All right? Here we go. Ready? Let's go. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Let me pray and we'll close this time with a benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit allow us to turn to God in desperate times for He makes a promise and He wants to assure us that He will lead us and guide us. There is a light at the end of the tunnel and He will take us there. Amen. That the highest king would welcome me. I was lost, but he brought me.